We are very pleased to have uh, Professor Claude Couture with us today. He's been a professor of social sciences and Canadian studies at Campus Saint-Jean, Univers Université de l'Alberta, since 1988. He was director of the Canadian Studies Institute uh, of the University of Alberta from 2000 to 2010. He's an excellent teacher and received the Rutherford Award for Excellence in Teaching from the University of Alberta in 2006 and the pre very prestigious University Cup of the University of Alberta in 2009. In 2014, he was awarded the Governor General's International Award for his contributions to Canadian studies. His research interests are in the area of intellectual and social history. He's the author and co-author of 15 books and also has published extensively in academic journals and chapters in edited books. Claude is a former a director with the Center uh, for Constitutional Studies Board of Directors and so we're very pleased to have him back here with us today. <clears throat> well, um, thank you, uh, Patricia. Um, in addition to uh, recognizing our presence on the Treaty 6 territory, I just want to also express my support to uh, President Turpin's initiative today regarding the last uh, uh, American uh, executive measures regarding uh, immigration. I also want to uh, offer my sympathy for the uh, victims and families of uh, the shooting in Quebec City uh, yesterday. Indeed, uh, it is a pleasure for me to, uh, to come back here. I've not been in the Faculty of Law for many years. Campus Saint-Jean is only five kilometers east of the North Campus, yet sometimes it seems like galaxies away. Uh, and indeed, for many years in the 1990s and early 2000s, I sat on the uh, board of the Center for Constitutional Studies, and I had the pleasure to work with uh, excellent scholars like David Schneiderman and uh, Zvika Kahana, who was their uh, predecessors of, of Patricia. So to come back here is uh, bringing very good memories. Uh, so thank you again for this uh, invitation. This year is, is indeed the 150th anniversary of the BNE Act. A year ago, we celebrated, so to speak, the 100th anniversary of the Irish uh, Eastern Uprising. And in 2017, also 2017 also marks the uh, 160th anniversary of the Indian Mutiny. These events and their commemoration are important to remind us that we were part of an empire and we're still part of some structures inherited from that empire. The Canadian historian Philip Buckner said that empire matters. Of course, it did matter and it is still mattering. For the title, uh, and someone before the presentation uh, was asking already good question about, about good questions about the title. Maybe the, the title, the choice of words uh, would have, could have been better. What I just want to express by the title is the fact that utilitarian, utilitarianism, and I did practice uh, for that <laughs> word before, but utilitarianism might be in a way, a forgotten political philosophy today, but it played a crucial role uh, in the imperial cultural network of the 19th century. So I just want to, and I'm, I'm just inviting you today for this presentation to explore this imperial network of the 19th century and first half of the 20th century and try to uh, uh, explain why utilitarianism was so important and perhaps still important today. This invitation to speak here came a year ago uh, from Patricia uh, 
After a presentation in the Department of History and Classics, uh, uh, during which I was commenting on the Caron case and the decision of the Supreme Court in the fall of 2015 uh, regarding uh, the possibility of cons a constitutional obligation for Alberta uh, to be bilingual. In that presentation, I was commenting on, on the discussion of Canadian history uh, in that case and uh, a discussion about the meaning of the word rights uh, in the context of, uh, of the 19th century and later on early 20th century. So today, using the idea of historians like Tony Ballantyne and Antoinette Burton, that the empire was, among many things, a cultural web connecting di disparate parts. And also, uh, I will be using a similar concept by Alan Lester about the empire as an imperial, an imperial network and a cultural imperial network. So the outline is the following. The presentation is in three parts. The starting point is uh, about Louis Arts, an American, of course, political scientist. I'm talking about this because I'm also trying to, uh, to invite you to explore with me my own intellectual trajectory uh, since my years as a, as a graduate student in Quebec. And uh, as Patricia mentioned, you probably realize that I've been here now for 30 years. So I just want to explain my perception of, uh, of liberalism, actually, and the political culture and philosophy in the English-speaking world from the perspective of someone who grew up in Montreal in, in, a, in a francophone environment. In that sense, uh, Louis Arts, of course, had a great deal of influence in the United States and overall the English-speaking world, but also had a great deal of influence among political philosophers, French Canadians in Quebec of the 1970s and 80s. My second point will be about some important, some important uh, uh, philosophers uh, who, of course, uh, develop the political philosophy of utilitarianism. And I want to throw the idea of perhaps we should also talk about British exceptionalism when we look at what happened in the British Empire in the 19th century. And finally, my third point will be about the 50s and, and until today. Uh, it seems to me uh, that since the 1950s and the 1960s, with the dismantlement of the, uh, of the British Empire, many imperialists in the UK and here in uh, British Canada were kind of orphans. They were imperialists without an empire. That was, of course, uh, of major consequence, and I would like to address that in the third point. So, 40 years ago, basically all social sciences students at the University of Montreal have to read a book by political scientist André Gibelanger, a book about the apolitical uh, nature of uh, Quebec ideologies. In that book, though, the start of the book is uh, about the theory of uh, the ide ideological fragment by Louis Arts. Louis Arts, of course, was a professor of political science at the uh, University of Harvard. Uh, it seems that Trudeau uh, followed a couple of his courses. And uh, he, of course, wrote about the liberal tradition in America. There was a follow-up involving uh, some Canadian scholars and André G. Bélanger starts his book by, by, by this notion of the ideological fragment. What was the ide ide ideological fragment? It was this idea that at the time of colonialism, European colonizers, when they developed colonies around the world, took with them two main ideological fragments, and those ideological fragments uh, were composing the Europe as a whole. One of those fragments was, of course, the attachment to a more communitarian and feudal, traditional uh, uh, 
structure of society and power. And the other one was more aimed at individualism and of course was particularly developed uh, in the UK. And even have a philosophical, philosophical, philosophical form, excuse me, uh, which was uh, the Lockean philosophy and its insistence of, of, on rights and the notion of property and individuality. According to arts, of course, the United States, and that was a point of view repeated many times in, uh, in American historiography, American exceptionalism was defined by that, by that fragment that became the, the entire political culture of the United States. Other colonies around the world, most of them developed develop both fragments in a constant dialectic uh, relation between communitarism on one side or a fixation on community and traditions on, on one side and individualism on the other. In the case of Canada, it was explained that British Canada, of course, developed the two fragments and that was a characteristic of English Canada or British Canada in terms of its, its dynamic, this, this constant dialectic uh, pro process involving tradition on one end and individualism on the other. Of course, in Canada, the only part of Canada that developed only the, according to that theory, this, this traditional fragment was, of course, Quebec or French Canada, which was only characterized by the, the weight of tradition in its political culture. Yeah. So, Having to read, to read that many years ago, many decades ago, uh, sadly, I have to say, um, it was always in my mind that somewhere in the English-speaking culture, political culture, the Lockean fragment was, was really important in terms of the, and its connection to liberalism, a liberalism that, that has, uh, a main, uh, uh, has main characteristics uh, individualism and, of course, property. Later on, and I was already a professor here for many years, at the turn of the, of the 21st century, a Canadian, Canadian historian, uh, Ian McKay, in an article published in the Canadian uh, Historical Review, and that article is reproduced in a book published by Michel Ducharme and Jean-François Constant only seven years ago, Ian McKay suggested that Canada was a project of liberal rule or, and liberal order. He wrote about his project. The core argument is succinct. The category Canada shall be henceforth denote a historically specific project of rule rather than either an essence we must defend or an empty homogeneous space we must possess. Canada as project can be analyzed through the study of the implementation and ex expansion over a heterogeneous uh, terrain of a certain political economic logic, to wit, liberalism. And again, a liberal, Ian McKee is writing, a liberal order is one that encourages and seeks to extend across time and space Belief in the epistemological and ontological primacy of the category individual. Canada as a project can be defined as an attempt to plant and nurture in somewhat unlikely soil the philosoph philosophical assumptions and the related political and uh, iconic practices of a liberal order. And finally, Mickey is writing in its classical 19th century form, liberalism entails a hierarchy of principles with formal equality at the bottom and property at the top. Conceptualized in this way, liberalism as a hierarchical ensemble of ideological principles can be distinguished from the historical forms it has assumed, and it can also be distinguished from the competing ideological formation alongside which it evolved and while it worked to envelop and include, or to silent, or even to eliminate. 
So, in my mind, this is a very elastic definition of liberalism and a possible liberal order. Now, from a different perspective, in his book on the six theories of justice, Will Kimlicka, himself borrowing from John Rawls, situates liberalism in the tradition of the 17th and 18th centuries of the social contract, an aspect not mentioned by Mekke. In this tradition, the starting point is a discussion on the state of nature and what is identified in that state of nature as what could be used in order to shape the next level, which is society. Undoubtedly, in the Lockean tradition, property is the main feature of that state of nature that should be protected at the, stage, at the next stage of society. This implies a predetermined order of principles on which society is built in this liberal approach. This is where a possible problem occurs when one ties and look at the Mekai project and this approach by Kim Lika and, and borrowing himself, as I said, uh, to uh, John Rawls. Because both Kim Lika and before him John Rawls considers that utilitarianism, not liberalism, was the main political philosophy of the last two centuries in the English-speaking world and that contemporary liberalism, uh, meaning the philosophy of John Rawls, was a reaction against utilita utilitarianism. So what could be the difference between liberalism and utilitarianism? There is a lot of confusion and there are many culprits. One perhaps uh, first culprit is uh, John Stuart Mill. Sorry, I forgot to uh, switch the slides. Louis Hart is the sh a schematization of his, of his theory. Mekke's, uh, 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 the book based on Mekke's contribution and the contributions of several other historians about this idea of Canada as a liberal order. And now some of the main philosophers in the utilitarian tradition, the founder, of course, Jeremy Bentham and his mummy, because he was mummified uh, beside him, beside his portrait. The famous Panopticon, and uh, for those who have read Foucault, of course, you have noticed the deep admiration of Foucault, Michel Foucault for Bentham. Foucault considered Bentham as the most important philosophers of modern times. Someone who expressed perfectly well and if I even contributed to this obsession of modernity about, 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 about security and surveillance, a very appropriate thematic these days. And of course, the, this, this invention, the design of the panopticon uh, for, for, for which, as I said, Foucault, or about, about what Foucault, uh, Foucault wrote a, lo a lot about the panopticon and panopticism. And then back to the usual culprits when, when we talk about uh, utilitarianism. So I just want to say a few words about, about John Stuart Mill. In some literature, John Stuart Mill is considered a transition uh, between utilitarianism and liberalism because of his essay published in 1859 on liberty. There is a, a lot of, so of, of confusion about liberalism as a political philosophy and the British Liberal Party that formed in, in mid-19th century, which was some kind of a, amalgam between what was left of the Whig Party, uh, militants of the uh, anti-corn laws and supporters of Robert Peel, some supporters of the Chartist movement and some radicals. John Stuart Mill himself was briefly a member of parliament as a representative of the Liberal Party. Also, for, for those who, who wanted to read in French uh, about uh, political philosophy in the English-speaking world, uh, in France, Elie Alivi, uh, an important historian of, of political philosophy, wrote a book on utilitarianism. And there is in his book some kind of confusion between utilitarianism and 
uh, liberalism and also liberal politicians. So now let's go back briefly to Jamie Bentham, the founder of utilitarianism. And of course, one of his main followers of the 19th century was John Stuart Mill's father, James Mill. And let's also recall that both James Mill and John Stuart Mill both uh, played a key role in the administration of the East India Company and the, the, uh, the colonial private rule through the East India Company in India until 18, 1857. And although, although John Stuart Mill uh, criticized some aspects of his father's philosophy uh, on the issue of colonialism. They were absolutely on the same page, and they were even on the same payroll. But let's go back briefly to Jeremy Bentham. In the conception of its founder, Jeremy Bentham, utilitarianism was going to shake the foundation of traditional societies by a new moral philosophy of evaluating what, what should be a good government and good actions from an ethical point of view on the basis of the good consequences of the, of the actions of both the individuals and the government. Material happiness for a majority was the only measure of good ethics. So instead of a social contract based on principles to be protected as rights, Utilitarianism was, uh, in fact, evaluating only the positive consequences of the acts. It was a philosophy designed first by its passionate opposition to the idea of, and the principle of the social contract. Designed first by Bentham to question conservatism and traditions, utilitarianism, however, evolved from a critique of colonialism, and although there's a lot of literature about Bentham, his ambiguous position on slavery, but there's also uh, uh, many texts by Bentham in which he's condemning uh, colonialism. When he was invited by the French at the beginning of the French Revolution, he presented a paper uh, about the necessity, the importance of, of getting rid of colonies. In that said, Bentham and his criticism of colonialism uh, echoed uh, uh, Edmund Burke, who two weeks before the, the start of the French Revolution, launched a lawsuit and a, and a process of impeachment uh, in Parliament against Warren Hastings uh, in the name of, of, uh, of, the, of, of basically uh, the, the corruption that was, that was uh, spreading uh, in India uh, and the non-respect of, uh, of uh, Indian cultural and, and, and sovereign uh, uh, aspects. And for, for, of course, Edmund Burke, uh, what the East India Company did already by the 1780s uh, was, was something that uh, had to be criticized and also described as an intolerable form of, of corruption, corruption of, of, of ethics and corruption also in terms of the way some of the administrators of the East India Company uh, became very rich, starting with Lord Clive. So from the beginning of the 19th century to the end of the 19th century, utilitarianism evolved from first a political philosophy designed to, as I said, uh, shape the foundations of conservatism and tradition. But by the end of the 19th century, um, it was a key element of a key ideological and philosophical element of the empire. In between, as I said, John Stuart Mill played a key role, both as an administrator of the East India Company, but also as a political philosopher. So on this, I just want to, to point out that uh, despite all the literature, seeing Mill as someone who was ambiguous between the political philosophy of liberalism based on the idea of the social contract and the defense of property as a right, and on the other, utilia utilitarianism, which was based only on the evaluation for the, the well-being of, of the majority of, of, the, of the consequences of the acts, I would say that Mill was always, always loyal to the initial principle of utilitarianism. 
uh, a few quotes here from On Liberty. It is proper to state that I forego any advantage which could be derived to my argument from the idea of an abstract right as a thing independent of utility. I regard utility as the ultimate appeal on all ethical questions. But it must be utility in the largest sense, grounded on the permanent interest of a man as a progressive being. Those interests I contend authorize the subjection of individual spontaneity to external control only in respect to those actions of each which concern the interests of other people. If anyone does an act hurtful to others, this is a prima facie case for punishing him by law or where legal penalties are not safely applicable by general disapprobation. After publishing on liberty in 15, 1859, an essay, uh, and on the cover of that essay, of course, as co-author, the name of his wife, Harriet Taylor, should have been, should have been uh, there. And uh, uh, a few years later, after the passing away of Harriet Taylor, John Stuart Mill came with another uh, essay, first published in, uh, in magazines, and as a whole as a book in 1863, simply titled Utilitarianism. There is a passage here, a very short passage, which is very important, I think, and I quote, to have a right then is, I conceive, to have something which society ought to defend me in the possession, possession of. If the objector goes on to ask why it all, I can give no other reason than general utility. So as I said, I think that there was never any ambiguity about the fact that we, even when he wrote about liberty, John Stuart Mill stayed loyal to the main principle of utilitarianism and saw liberty as an element in order to achieve utility. Also, individuality for him is a prerequisite to the satisfaction of pleasures and, again, the accomplishment regarding utility. A few years after the publication of, uh, of uh, On Liberty, uh, a young lawyer from uh, uh, the UK went to India played a major role in the uh, reshaping of the criminal code in India. And later on, also uh, based on that work, he wanted to, to also uh, reform criminal, criminal law in, uh, in, in the UK, but he was never able to achieve it. However, in some of the dom dominions, including Canada, his work was apparently greatly influential. When he came back to the UK after his stay in, uh, in India and uh, on the boat uh, on his way back, he wrote a book uh, uh, entitled, uh, ironically, Equality, Fraternity, uh, Liberty. And it was a wide out attack on, on John Stuart Mill's essay uh, on liberty. In this book, um, jo uh, James Fitzjames Stephen, uh, him himself, of course, the brother of Leslie Stephen, uh, Leslie Stephen, of course, being himself the, the father of Virginia Woolf, uh, an accomplished mountaineer, but also uh, 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 an impeccable intellectual, who also wrote uh, a, a book on the history of uh, political philosophy in England and a book on utilitarianism called the Utilitarian uh, English. And in, uh, by the way, that book on utilitarianism by Leslie Sleven also contributed to, to, the, to this interpretation of, uh, of John Stuart Mill as someone who was confused. But anyway, his, his, uh, his brother, James Fitzjames Stephen, wrote this devastating attack on John Stuart Mill uh, and making fun of John Stuart Mill for even thinking of connecting the concept of liberty with uh, the utilitarian philosophy. For him, the concept of liberty was, was an empty vase, a product of the French Revolution, and the one thing that all those thinkers had in mind, of course, was this deep hatred of the French Revolution. So in his essay, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, uh, James Fitzjames Stephen wrote, 
If the word liberty had any definite sense attached to it, and if it is consistently used in that sense, it is almost impossible to make any true generalization whatever about it, and quite impossible to regard it either as a good thing or a bad one. If, on the other hand, the word is used merely in a general popular way, without attracting any distinct signification to it, it is easy to make almost any general assertion you please about it. But these assertions will be incapable of either proof or disproof, as they will have no definite meaning. Thus, the word is either a misleading appeal to passion, or else it embodies, or rather hints, at an exceedingly complicated assertion, the truth of which can be proved only by elaborate historical investigations. <coughs> Later on, <coughs> uh, James Fitz James Stephen, who obviously was, was a grouch, who hated humanity uh, in an obscene way, obscenian way. James Fitz James uh, Stephen wrote, men are so constructed that whatever theory as to goodness and badness we choose to adopt, there are and always will be in the world, uh, in the world an enormous mass of bad and in different people, people deliberately do all sorts of things which they ought not to do, or, or leave undone all sorts of things which they ought to do. Estimate the proportion of men and women who are selfish, sensual, frivolous, idle, absolutely commonplace and wrapped up in the smallest of petty routines, and consider how far the freest of free discussion is likely to improve them. So, with the example of, uh, of James Fitz James Stephen, we could see that utilitarianism evolved first as a project to, sh to shake the foundations of tradition and conservatism uh, through uh, the vision of Jeremy Bentham, but undoubtedly by the end of the century with authors like James Fitz James Stephen, it became a justification for the stabilization of a traditional society based on hierarchy and stability and in the context of the expansion of the imperial, uh, I mean, the British Empire. In a way, there was a constitution in the 19th century that perfectly expressed that vision. And these are some of the main utilitarianists in the 19th century. And regarding to these, these authors, most of them professors at Oxford or, or Cambridge, or the case of uh, Fitzjames Stephen, of course, he became a judge and a prominent uh, uh, jurist. But many, many years before, uh, authors like uh, Ballantyne, Burton, uh, Alan Lester wrote about either the imperial network or uh, the empire as a cultural web. There was a branch of the historiography on the British Empire uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 historians like, uh, like Gallagher and, and Robinson, who wrote about the British Empire also as something characterized by an official mind. What they meant by that is, is that the, the bureaucrats of the empire, the intellectuals, were all trained in a certain way, mostly uh, uh, with a strong influence of utilitarianism, and that created this, this, this official mind that whatever the bureaucrats of the empire were, they saw the same thing because of that official mind. Whether they were in India or here in North America, the bureaucrats of the empires were always seeing the same thing. And in most cases, they were seeing things through the glasses of utilitarianism. In a way, though, when we think about constitutions, there was a constitution that perfectly express the system of the 19th century, a constitution that encapsulated the structure of the entire um, empire, not just of India. I'm talking here about the act of, for a, a better government in India of 1858. As you know, in 1857, uh, Indians rebelled against the British Empire and the East India Company. The horror of the massacres of, on both sides <coughs> was uh, astronomical. Uh, one also would like to point out, however, that uh, the British, uh, in their uh, uh, intent to repress the rebellion, uh, 
show the horrific, quotation mark, savagery in the way that they killed hundreds of thousands of, of Indians. That led to a new way of governing India in which the East India Company, of course, uh, lost all of its interest in India and was replaced directly by the state, the British state. The act for a better government in India is a masterpiece of mixture of conservatism, tradition, and utilitarianism. And even if James Fitzjames uh, Stephen wrote later, in a way, already these ideas were there, and the Indian Act of 1858 and the system that was put in place for almost a century was, as I said, this odd mixture of utilitarianism, tradition, even feudalism. Time is flying so very quickly here. The Constitution of India, of, 18, of the Empire, uh, and the, the British Empire in India in, in 1858, was a structure that divided India in eight major provinces, some of them called, for example, the Presidency of Bombay and other states. Let's also remark that uh, at that time, this British Raj included, of course, what became later Pakistan and, of course, later uh, Bangladesh, but also Burma and way down here on, on the coast. Today, the population on that territory will be equal to uh, a billion and 600 uh, million uh, people. Most of what is, well, my map is not very good there, but most of what is pinkyish uh, were those provinces. Uh, interlocked and integrated with those provinces and local states uh, were 565 princely states, 565 small states with an Indian ruler, sometimes directly, uh, although, however, the supervision of a British ruler, sometimes with a, with a semi-autonomy. 500 and 65 princely states. That was, in a way, the, how can I say that? That was, in a way, freezing medieval, medieval and feudal structures in a so-called modern project of colonizing a region in the world. And that was, perhaps, one of the main characteristics of the British exceptionalism claiming to give and develop progress around the world and modernity, and at the same time, fixing, like if time has, has no more uh, uh, say, fixing medieval structures in a political structure. So my point simply, I remember the starting point of all this, was to celebrate the greatness of our country and the greatness of the b &E Act just by remembering the context of the 19th century, the colonial context of the 19th century. I think that if we want to go anywhere, um, in terms, for example, of reconciliation with uh, indigenous nations, we, there must be a massive, spectacular recognition of the imperial and colonial past. Things changed in the 20th century, as I said jokingly, by the 1960s, British Canadians were in a majority still very attached to the empire, and I suspect that there are still a lot of British Canadians still attached to the empire, or the nostalgia of empire. So in that context, though, something had to change. And by the 50s and 60s, even inside the UK, with the dismantlement of the British Empire, there was a shift of paradigm, which was from the, I think, utilitarian paradigm, with no, I think, with the, and its deep opposition to the idea of social contract and, by the way, human rights in a universal term, 
there was a shift of paradigm and in the English speaking world itself, a, re a discovery of now the social contract and the principle of human rights. Just briefly, um, two authors who wrote a lot about this shift of paradigm before it happened, just a few years before it happened. First, uh, John Buchan, the first baron of Tweed, uh, Tweed Smuia. Uh, and uh, John Buchan was a famous novelist, journalist, and also the Governor General of Canada from 1935 to 1940. He died in Montreal. But perhaps for those who, who love literature and cinema, John Buchan was also famous for being the author of the, of the espionage novel, The 39 Steps, which became even more famous when Alfred Hitchcock made a movie based on, on, the, on, the, on the novel. As for Sir Alfred uh, Eckerd uh, Zimmern, he was an ambassador, a diplomat, bureaucrat, and in a nutshell, both wrote a lot about a new vision for, for what what would be the, 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 the third empire, which should be a commonwealth of free nations with no racism, equality among nations, and uh, uh, the uh, progress of democracy in that new commonwealth. That was basically preparing the shift of paradigm, which happened, I think, in the 1960s and 70s. And of course, in the country of Canada, came Pierre Elliott Trudeau, the official language is law of 1969 and later on the Charter of Rights. And by the time of uh, 1982, we had completely shifted paradigm. And it was a successful shift to the point that we forgot the importance of utilitarianism and its, its deep influence in a political culture characterized by this total opposition to the notion of, of human rights. So, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, I think that in the context of the celebration of our great country, we should perhaps pass a test about the legacy of, of, the, of colonialism and pass a test using two concepts of the great Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1998, in a remarkable book entitled The Idea of Justice. Amartya Sen sees two legacies of the Enlightenment. A first legacy, he called it the legacy of the social contract. And he doesn't like this legacy, no. He sees in the legacy of the social contract from the 18th and 19th centuries, because he has a, defin uh, a larger definition of the Enlightenment. But he calls the social contract a vision that is based on the idea of transcendental institutions. He sees the social contract and the approach of the social contract as an attempt to find perfect institutions in terms of the administration of justice. He sees philosophers like Locke, and even if they are opposed, perhaps ideologically, at, at, at the surface, but in terms of, of their convergence, he, he sees the convergence of these philosophers in terms of the idea of the social contract and the perfect institutions. So he sees in that tradition Locke, Rousseau, Kant, Hegel, and of course, in the 20th century, John Rawls. But he sees another legacy of the Enlightenment, which he called the legacy based on the social choice. And of course, Amartya Sen won the Nobel Prize in Economics basically for his critical work of the stupidity of the British policies in India in the 19th century that prompted all those famines and no less than 60 million people who died. So, in, however, in the tradition of the Enlightenment and that second choice is the idea of, of, the, of, of the, so, precisely the social choice uh, to be deferred from the social contract. In that approach, the idea is not to create the perfect institutions in terms of the governance of justice, but the idea is to simply try to eliminate as much as possible injustice. And the idea here is to, is, to, is to not to start with the discussion on abstract principles, but to look at the situations of people and communities and individuals, look at their situation, what is on the field, compare the situations, and from that point, 
come up with solutions, once again, with the objective of eliminating injustice. In that tradition, Amartya Sen sees Adam Smith, Bentham, John Stuart Mill, and Marx, as I said, even if there are many contradictions between these authors, but he sees in, he sees in these authors people who were more willing to concentrate on what is, what is the reality, how are people, what is the situation, and from there move on and find solutions. So some 35 years after the new constitutional law and the Charter of Rights, what have we seen in the last 25 years? Dozens and dozens of lawsuits, most of them going to the Supreme Court level, involving communities challenging the application of the principles of linguistic rights in, in this country, but also mostly dozens and dozens of cases involving the application of the recognition of, of Métis rights and indigenous rights. It seems to me that there is a gap between the recognition of those principles and the application in terms of policies of those principles, which is, I think, the most important challenge of Canada today. I just want to say that in terms of recognizing this legacy of uh, colonialism, perhaps it will help to remove the third paragraph of the Constitutional Act. Uh, third paragraph, which is still there, and it says, and whereas such a union would conduce to the welfare of the provinces and promote the interests of the British Empire. Well, I want to thank you, Claude. Mm. Merci beaucoup. Oh, because yeah. I think that it's, uh, you provided us a very interesting way of looking at the foundations of, uh, of the way in which we were constituted, in fact, and the philosophical foundations and, and, it's, and, and how those, the paradigm is shifted. So I, I shifted. I, I thank you very, very much. I think you've given us all a great deal to think about. So merci. Oh, thank you. Merci, merci. de ton retour. <laughs> thank you. Oh, a gift. Thank and you. If we could all thank, and please do <coughs> fill out your forms if you would, and uh, sign up if you'd like to know about our future events. So merci. You would join me.